go. So um, welcome everyone to our usual RHW Zoom session. And we are extremely privileged today to have Ola Salstad all the way from Norway uh, speaking to us on one of the most important changes in newborn resuscitation in the last, I would say, three, four decades using air for resuscitation of hypoxic babies instead of oxygen. But something new this time, he will talk to us about the addition of therapeutic hypothermia with air resuscitation. So um, Ola is now Professor Emeritus of Oslo University and one of the biggest inspirations to everyone, including myself. So um, I myself would say that I wouldn't be anywhere without you, Ola. So thank you very much. Um, and if we do have a chance to meet up again, we'll have a beer and then you can go for a run. Uh, so um, I think we might be ready to go if you are ready. Yes, I am. So, yep. So the usual, Ola will speak for about 45 minutes and then um, uh, you can just ask questions by chat and then he has to run off to Rome to speak again. So over to you, Ola. Thank you very much. Here we go. So do you see and hear me? Yes, no? it's perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so thank you so much, uh, Julie, for um, inviting me. Um, whenever you invite me, of course, I try to uh, say yes, although I think this, uh, this topic was quite challenging. Uh, so I will um, start out uh, talk about uh, oxygenation in general, and I will end up with some uh, data regarding uh, cooling and um, uh, and oxygenation. Um, I hope that is okay, and I will go on for forty five minutes. So, um, good morning or afternoon or evening, everyone. Um, it's it's uh, always nice to to give lectures, and. Um, so um, I start out with, um, um, let's see, I have to get rid of something here, yeah. So I will start out with some general um, considerations. Um, first about uh, the goals of oxygen therapy of, of the newborn. And of course, the, the most important is to provide sufficient oxygen to the tissues and to avoid the anaerobic metabolism. And, and further, we want to prevent hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. I come back to that uh, um, in a while. And to promote secure brain and somatic growth. And I think every neonatologist is also aware of this um, 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 and how important it is to minimize adverse effects of uh, hyperoxia and oxidative stress. Now, <clears throat> Julie mentioned uh, the change in attitude to using oxygen in the delivery room. And I tried to summarize uh, uh, the development uh, the last 30 years or so. And, and the first guidelines I know about uh, on uh, newborn recitation from 1992 by American Heart Association stated that 100% <clears throat> oxygen should be used. It is not toxic. There's no reason to be concerned. Um, well, I was concerned because um, uh, for, uh, for several reasons, and I had been concerned for more than 10 years, and we had just started uh, some um, animal studies, newborn piglets. We couldn't demonstrate that oxygen during uh, recitation of newborn piglets was toxic, but we were able to show, we had shown already at that time, that it is possible to resuscitate with air, just as, as good as uh, using 100% oxygen. Now the 2000 ILCOR, uh, American Heart Association's guidelines, I was so um, <clears throat> privileged, I was in, on the panel uh, for these uh, guidelines, and um, they state that 100% oxygen should be used, and I couldn't argue against that because we didn't have that much data uh, 20 years ago. 
but I think a very important. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it was very important <clears throat> that the guidelines uh, or recommendations added that, however, if oxygen is not available, use room air. Because many places in the, in the world where oxygen was not available, uh, newborns uh, who needed ventilation were not even tried to be uh, resuscitated because many people thought that you, you need oxygen in order to, extra oxygen in order to resuscitate a newborn baby. So I think that was important. Now, five years later, um, Ilkor admitted that the optimal oxygen concentration is not known for newborn vegetation. There is no reason to change the initial oxygen concentration. So that uh, triggered um, a change. And in 2006, um, Canada was the first country which changed their national guidelines from um, 100% oxygen to air. And a few months later, Australia was the second um, <clears throat> change of guidelines. And I was so fortunate I, uh, to visit Australia uh, those days. And um, it was very interesting to see how enthusiastic uh, people in Australia were for this uh, change. So in 2010, the, the real breakthrough came when Ilkor uh, said that um, adverse outcomes may result from even brief exposure to excessive oxygen during and following recitation. So you can see it has been a 180 degree shift from 1992 when American Heart Association said that uh, there's no reason to be concerned for using 100% oxygen, even brief. Uh, so Ilkor then said in term infants receiving recitation at birth with positive pressure ventilation, it is best to begin with air rather than 100% oxygen. So that uh, ended a kind of a 30 years um, discussion and, and research, uh, at least from my, uh, my, for me and for my, my group. Now, if you um, go back to the basic physiology and we know that uh, the fetus uh, is hypoxemic low PO2s, saturations around 50, maybe up to 65%, and there is a pulmonary hypertension. And during delivery and normal transition, we know that uh, pulmonary hypertension resolves and there's a gradual improvement in the oxygen saturation, as you can see here. So <clears throat> we will argue that cyanosis is, is normal during fetal life and for the first few minutes after birth. And and then we'll question if it is really possible to get, a, get an APCA score of, of 9 or 10 at 1 minute or even at 5 minutes without giving oxygen. And if you look at some of the first um, um, nomograms showing how the, the saturation develops uh, after birth, this is from Mariana, <coughs> Mariani in 2007, you, you see how the, the saturation, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the saturation, here is the preductal, and the saturation increases from very low levels at two minutes of age, and you see this wide variation, and uh, some of these uh, are down on the 60s, normal, these are normal babies, and even at five minutes, you see that many of these babies have a low uh, saturation. So what happens if you resuscitate a newborn baby with 100% um, oxygen? Well, it happens the same as shown here, although this is in newborn lambs, that you get this um, enormous PO2 peak here. And you can compare it with, uh, with the more physiological approach. If you give air, and you see there's a slow, more slowly, um, uh, normalization and you reach this physiological level. Now, <clears throat> I have in, in my group, we have done uh, thousands of uh, animal experiments, uh, mostly with the newborn piglets, but also with uh, mice. And when we summarize some of these data <clears throat> some years ago, so here we have two of my fellows at that time, uh, Yannick Andresen and Renak Sulberg, preparing the, the piglet model. And here is the model we were using, newborn piglets 
were exposed to 8% um, oxygen until they were close to collapse, uh, which we defined as uh, mean blood pressure less than 15 millimeter mercury or a base excess uh, less than minus 20. And we, we, we knew from experience that um, at this point, uh, the piglets were very close to collapse. So then we resuscitate with different oxygen concentrations and um, we followed um, the pigs uh, another six hours, for instance. So the, the piglet model is, is a, a good model because uh, the brain resembles the human brain um, at a term, for instance. So this is what we found here. We, we see how the PO2 after 15 minutes of recitation increases with increasing FiO2 and it's, it's not on the linear, it's a, almost an expen exponential pattern here. And you see if you give 100% oxygen, you get, get this very high uh, PO2 levels. <clears throat> we also measured the hydroxyl radical formation. And, um, and again, you find the same pattern that uh, hyperoxia uh, it, uh, increases uh, free radical formation. And also DNA damage increases uh, in this exactly the same pattern. So here is a summary of, of what we had found um, at that stage. And um, so here we have the different uh, FiO2s from, from air up to 100% oxygen. And you see DNA damage here at the top, hydroxyl radical, the PO2 uh, shown here. We also found that uh, met uh, metalloproteinases um, increases uh, with increasing FiO2 in the lung, in the liver, and the brain. And we think that reflects um, an inflammation in these organs. Caspase 3 increases, and uh, BDNF, which is um, brain protective, is uh, decreasing. So we, we, we also lose some of the protection when we expose these animals to hyperoxia. So to make a long uh, story short, this is a um, meta-analysis uh, we carried out. Actually, the, the last meta-analysis we carried out. So um, think about communication and communicating effectively. Um, so the patient education scenarios okay. were actually... Well, I think there's some background. Um, so um, we published our first um, clinical study together with Siddharth Ramji. In, in Delhi in 1993 as a pilot study. And in 1998, we, we published the first multicenter randomized study, the RESA2. And then another 10 studies have been published in this field. So we tried to summarize uh, all these data, more than 2,000 uh, babies randomized or, or quasi randomized to air or 100% oxygen in the delivery room if they needed ventilation. And here is the main finding, there's a 30% reduction in mortality. And so that was the, the background for the change in, in the ILCO recommendation in 2010. So the world map regarding oxygen or newborn recitation um, uh, guidelines around the world uh, quickly started to change. As I mentioned, Canada, Australia were the first uh, nations and then um, I think uh, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, Finland, Russia, UK, Spain followed. Uh, actually, the US was uh, one of the last uh, countries to change their guidelines. Uh, right, stop. Nice. Hello? Yeah. Sorry. Uh... Is there any problem? No. no. Okay. Um, so at this stage, 2009, many babies were still receiving uh, ventilation with 100% oxygen and having this peak that more and more babies had this more gentle approach, more physiological approach with the uh, air. So I tried to summarize <clears throat> this um, research in one, one slide. It's 10 years since I published this. But it started out with um, hypersantin, which is a breakdown product from ATP. I started to measure hypersantin um, early in the 70s <clears throat> when I was um, I just finished medical school and started my research in, in Sweden. 
and um, hypoxanthin increases uh, during intrauterine hypoxia. So I thought we could use this as a, a marker of uh, of hypoxia, which I think still is it's a good marker of hypoxia. But there's another <clears throat> aspect which is maybe more important and that is uh, hypoxanthin is a potential free radical generator when it's oxidized to uric acid so this is translated uh, to uh, the mortality numbers here we had found in our studies uh, that mortality was higher when we gave 100 percent oxygen instead of, of air and, and i still think it's because we produce more free radicals so at that time, <clears throat> 4 million newborn babies had been estimated uh, needed recitation and mortality uh, decreased to approximately 5% from 12.8 to 8.2. And we could calculate that this corresponds to more than 200,000 lives that potentially are saved by switching from 100% oxygen to room air. So there's, there's a very... Uh, fine numbers of, of newborns who can be rescued just by this simple maneuver. Now it's not <clears throat> um, sufficient to keep the oxygenation normal only in the delivery room. In 2005 this study was published from Canada from Klinger and co-workers where they looked at the outcome at two years of age for babies who needed recitation in the delivery room. And uh, they looked at the outcome related to uh, severe hy hyperoxemia or hypocapnia, um, the first two hours after birth. And what they found was that if uh, <clears throat> the babies had been exposed to severe hyperoxemia or hypocapnia, there was a threefold increased risk of adverse outcome. And you can see at the bottom here, the definition of um, adverse outcome. Now, if hyperoxemia and severe hypocapnia was, uh, were um, combined, you see there's a 4.5 fold uh, increased risk of um, severe outcome. So the conclusion of this study was that you should keep the PO2 and PCO2 as normal as possible, um, also in the period after resuscitation. And then some years later, um, Kapadia published this study from Dallas, Texas, where he, he and uh, his um, uh, co-workers, they, they looked at the association between um, um, moderate to severe hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and the PO2 at admission to the NICU. And what you see here is that if the PO2 is in the physiological range, you know, um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy uh, rate is low. By contrast, if you have a high uh, PO2, it's a fourfold increase. So it's clear from these uh, data that moderate or severe um, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy is associated with the degree of hyperoxemia. So I, I, I wrote a commentary uh, when this uh, article was published in Journal of Pediatrics um, and concluded that post-resuscitation normoxia may reduce the need for hypothermia. And I tried to make a calculation um, and uh, estimated that several thousand uh, US babies could be prevented from you see, from cooling. They didn't need cooling if we kept the um, PO2 in the normal range. Um, so people say that there's only one um, way to, to prevent the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy injuries by cooling. I think we also should include, uh, it is also to avoid um, hyperoxia. Now, when um, I traveled around and gave lectures about this in the 90s, uh, especially in the 90s, early 2000, uh, there were a lot of critical uh, 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 voices and, and 
most uh, common uh, criticism or, or objections were the first of all that it is evident that if you, you lack oxygen, you should give oxygen. And that's true, but you shouldn't give too much. And in other, oh, I think at every meeting, someone stood up and said that we need oxygen in, in order to reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. And that's true because Abram Rudolph uh, had shown already in the 60s uh, that uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance is dependent on the PO2. And this is from uh, animal studies in, in newborn calves. But, and you see that when the PO2 is around 40, uh, there is no further reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, by contrast, if the PO2 in increases too much, it, it looks like there is a tendency to increase uh, resistance again. And the same here for the pulmonary arterial mean pressure, exactly the same pattern. So we don't need to give too much oxygen in order to open up the, the pulmonary circulation after birth. So <clears throat> together with Satyan Laxmin Rushamain in uh, UC Davis in, in California, we tried to illustrate what happens when you resuscitate with air versus uh, oxygen. So using air, the PO2 normalizes slowly into the physiological level some free radicals are, are generated. And by contrast, if you use 100% oxygen, you get this peak as I've shown uh, previously, and you get a lot of free radicals. And it's, this is translated to the baby uh, th that, uh, uh, so you get cerebral vasoconstriction and brain inflammation. And it has been shown by, by Satyan and his group uh, that pulmonary vascular reactivity even increases when you resuscitate with 100% uh, oxygen. And it's uh, also been shown that um, you get myocardial damage and acute renal injury. And um, let's see what happens. Oh, everything stopped here. Yeah. Here it comes. And um, it's also an association between uh, um, exposure to hyperoxia the first 10 minutes of life and uh, later childhood leukemia. So there are many reasons why we should be very careful giving 100% oxygen during uh, recitation. Now, <clears throat> then we, we started to uh, ask uh, if we need oxygen, how much oxygen, how, how long, what is the duration uh, we need to give oxygen? So we did some studies again in uh, newborn piglets um, using the same model as I have described. And now we looked at the microcirculation in the striatum and, and the cortex. And we had three, three groups. Um, uh, one group uh, was uh, resuscitated with 100% uh, oxygen for five minutes. Um, that's group two. Um, uh, that's group two, uh, group one. And then, uh, no, five minutes was group two. And then the first group was ventilated with 100% oxygen for 20 minutes. And then we had one ventilated with air. And you see here, when you look at the, in, the, in the striatum, there's no difference between these groups. But for in the cortex, you see that if you use air, yeah, the microcirculation is lower. But there's no difference if, well, between oxygen exposed for five or 20 minutes. So if you, you need oxygen, perhaps you shouldn't give it for, for a long time, maybe a few minutes only. Now, later we were able to show that if we added some moderate hypercapnia to the model, now this difference in, in the circulation between air and oxygen uh, disappeared more or less. So I think, and that is a more a clinical uh, situation. So what about small babies? Um, should we start high or low? And uh, so which um, F502 should we start out with? Uh, well, in 2007, eight, nine, the, the first studies uh, started to come out and one of the first came from Max Ventus group in Valencia, uh, where babies less than 29 weeks were randomized uh, 
in the delivery room if they needed ventilation, uh, they were randomized to receive 30 or 90% oxygen. So the in initial FO2 was adjusted uh, by increasing or reducing um, by 10% every 60, 90 seconds, according to the heart rate response and the saturation. So this is uh, what they found, um, and here is Max. Uh, and um, you see that the FO2 between the groups differed only the first four or five minutes. And the reason for that was, of course, that uh, they, they adjusted the FO2 according to the clinical response. There was no difference <clears throat> in the heart rate between the groups. And when they looked at the saturation, there was no difference, uh, which was, I think, surprising to all of us. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> when they looked at oxidative stress, they could show that uh, there was an increased um, uh, oxidative stress in babies receiving 90% oxygen initially, in spite of the fact that there was only a difference in FO2 for four or five minutes. And this um, difference uh, could be, be detected even after three days. And I think in term babies, Ventus, Max Ventus group has shown that uh, this may um, um, continue for, for up to two or three weeks. Uh, and not only oxidative stress, but uh, could also show that there is increased inflammation after hyperoxia. And then uh, Julie, <clears throat> our uh, chairperson uh, today, um, she um, conducted the torpedo trial, and uh, I was so. Uh, Julie has dropped out.
Hello, do you hear me? Okay, I'm extremely sorry for that. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, do you want to start sharing your slides again? That's okay. Yeah, I had to. I'm sorry, my it was uh, my my responsibility. I uh, yeah. That's okay. Dodgy internet. <laughs> um, if I now can find how to share my screen, um, here it is. Okay, so so <clears throat> let's go back to the torpedo trial, um, which was um, where, where Julie, our chairperson, was the uh, primary investigator. So in this um, study, the aim was to to randomize babies less than thirty-two weeks uh, to receive either. Uh, air or 100% oxygen in the delivery room if they needed ventilation. Now, <clears throat> there was a problem with the, the study and, and, and colleagues around on different centers, they, they hesitated to um, include babies uh, in the 100% oxygen arm because people were afraid of giving too much oxygen. So the study was uh, stopped prematurely, but um, when I looked at the whole cohort, there was no difference in mortality for all the babies, uh, whether you started with air or 100% oxygen. However, when um, uh, a post hoc analysis was carried out in babies less than 28 weeks, as you can see here, mortality was significantly increased in the Rumer uh, baby, relatively 3.9 for mortality. And that was, of course, um, concerning. So we have uh, carried out several uh, reviews and meta-analysis um, uh, to see if there's any difference in outcome uh, in preterm babies uh, resuscitated with, uh, with high FiO2 initially 60 to 100% oxygen versus low 21 to 30% oxygen. And here is one of the, the studies again carried out by, uh, by Julie. And, um, and here you can see all the studies um, included here. But the main uh, message here is that when it comes to uh, mortality, there was absolutely no difference whether you started with air or with 100% oxygen. And these are babies less than 32 weeks. And for secondary outcome measures as bronchopulmonary dysplasia or interventricular hemorrhage, again, there was no difference between the groups. Now, um, Louis and co-workers recently published a Cochrane review, uh, the same uh, topic, babies less than 32 weeks. Uh, 914 infants had been included in this uh, uh, review. And again, they found the same as uh, Julie uh, found the year earlier. That was absolutely no difference in mortality when you start with, with um, high FiO2 or low FiO2. And also for um, uh, developmental um, disability, there was no difference between these groups. Now, <clears throat> so when um, Julie did uh, the follow up of the torpedo um, patients. Uh, to, I think to everybody's uh, surprise, uh, it was shown that uh, the primary outcome, death or disability, was reduced 50% in babies who had reached a saturation of, of 80% or more within five minutes, as you can see here. And uh, when they looked at uh, the cognitive score, uh, again, babies who did not reach a saturation of 80% had a significantly lower cognitive score five points uh, less, and this was highly significant compared to those who reached a saturation of 80%. So this uh, was clearly a, a very important uh, information. And in addition, it was shown that uh, mortality was higher and also a severe in interventricular hemorrhage. Both were higher 
<clears throat> if the saturation had not reached 80% within five minutes. So that, this first five minutes, of course, became very um, important um, uh, and interesting for us to study. Now, before I, I go on, I will come back to how the saturation um, develops uh, after birth. Here's the first 10 minutes. This is a, a study very recently published from Max Ventel's group. And what they did here was that they added the saturation, this curve here, this is the median saturation in babies after delayed cord clamping and compared with the Dawson curves published 10 years ago. And you see that the saturation increases, is higher and, and increases uh, and reaches saturation of 80 faster if uh, uh, you practice delayed cord clamping. And uh, Max also was able to show that uh, there's a difference whether the baby is on CPAP or, or not in how the saturation develops. And this is of course not surprising, but what was surprising uh, at least at that time was that there's a difference between boys and girls and um, you know, saturation increases faster in, in girls. Of course, when you, you we know that uh, the, the girls are more mature, so they have more mature lungs. So it's not a, a surprise after all, when we think about that. So Julie and, um, and colleagues, um, and I've been so privileged to be part of this uh, group uh, we have followed a cohort of more than 700 babies, less than 32 weeks. And we have now looked at how the saturation develops um, according to the FiO2, initial FiO2, um, given to these babies in the delivery room. Uh, so we have the FiO2s to 21% or 30%, 60 to 65% or 100%. And, and we have uh, also different gestational ages. And this is how the saturation develops uh, babies uh, about 29 weeks um, and less than 32 weeks then. Um, and here, the, the shaded area here is the target uh, given by American Heart Association and the circles, the targets from the European Resuscitation Council. These are not evidence-based, but it's still interesting to see that all the groups uh, we're reaching the target or about the target, uh, except for those who received air initially. It took six, five, six minutes to reach the target. We don't know if this is good or bad uh, because we don't know if this target is, uh, is optimal. For babies less than 29 weeks, uh, the picture was a little bit uh, different because then it was only babies who had been given 90 to 100% oxygen uh, who reached the target uh, very quickly. All the other groups needed seven, eight minutes to reach the target. So <clears throat> the question is, should we start uh, with a low FiO2 and tighten it up if needed, or should we do the opposite, st start high and move down? And very recently, <clears throat> Decker and co-worker from Ariente Pass group in, in Leiden in, in the Netherlands, they, they published a study a small study with preterm infants uh, between 24 and 29 weeks uh, gestation uh, who had been randomized to receive 30% oxygen in the delivery room or 100% oxygen. I will not go into details here, but what they found was that if you resuscitate with 30% oxygen compared with 100%, uh, the babies uh, had a lower minute volume, longer duration of mask went was needed and there was lower oxygenation at five minutes, prolonged duration of hypoxemia and lower FiO2 exposure during the first five minutes. There was no difference in duration of hypoxemia and oxidative stress markers, but these were not followed for very long. Now, the problem is that um, uh, the question is, of course, then should we start high and tighten it down or should we start low and tighten it up? Now, the, the problem with the, with the last um, um, uh, strategy is that it's extremely difficult to sort out babies who would need extra oxygen the first few minutes after birth. This is a study from uh, Binder Heschel from Austria, 
uh, and showing that FIV2, how the FIV2 is developed in babies who reach a saturation of 80% and those who do not. And you see here the first two, three, four minutes. I mean, if you are in the delivery room, it's impossible to um, separate babies who eventually will end up with a res uh, with saturation of 80% two or three minutes later and those who do not. And also when they look at saturation, although there is a separation here after three, four minutes, but you know, in the delivery room, it's still, it's very difficult to, to sort out those babies. So we think that is uh, very um, difficult and it's a very challenging question. Should we start high or should we start low? Now, uh, Decker and coworkers, they argue that immature infants, in order to open the glottis, need some extra oxygen. In order to ventilate them, you need to give them a dash of oxygen. And um, studies in, in rabbits uh, show that this might be the case. We argue that uh, if we have to give oxygen to these immature babies, any supplementation should, in case, be as low and brief as possible because even a brief oxygen exposure induces long-term oxidative stress. So we don't know really um, how long we should give oxygen and which FiO2 we should start out with. Um, I would like to remind uh, all of you that uh, supplemental oxygen, even very brief, and we're talking about minutes, leads to increased oxidative stress, inflammation, genomic changes, reduced DNA repair and cell growth inhibition. And we also shown that we, we get epigenetic changes caused by oxygen exposure. On the other hand, most immature babies would need some oxygen. Um, and as I mentioned already, uh, it should be given as low and brief as possible. So we, we just uh, published an article um, in Journal of Pediatrics um, that was together with uh, uh, Satyan, Lakshmin, Rushima, and Max Vento, that we recommend to start low and tighten it up according to saturation and clinical response. And now I will, um, the, the last uh, few minutes, um, I will talk about uh, cooling and uh, oxygenation. So this is from a, an editorial I wrote, it was back in 2006, uh, where hypothermia still was not um, established therapy, but we, we started to get clinical studies indicating that uh, hypothermia after uh, asphyxia is, uh, is advantageous. I would like to start out with recognizing uh, the pioneer in this field, it, that is Galina Savveleyeva from, from Moscow, Russia. Already in, in the end of the 60s, she started to treat asphyctic babies uh, with uh, cooling. And uh, her, uh, some of her results has, have recently been, been summarized in, in the reference you can see here. So she was using kind of this coil, uh, putting on the head of the baby. Uh, in the beginning, it was a very primitive approach, but then they used this coil with, with uh, cooled water. Um, circulating the baby, and they got good results. But unfortunately, she published her um, studies in, in English uh, only. And here she is with, with one of her friends, I guess, uh, uh, who you all know. Well, back to the, the, the big clinical, the large clinical studies um, <clears throat> around the beginning of, the, of this century. Uh, it was uh, shown that uh, if you cool an uh, asphyctic term or near-term baby, you reduce the risk of death or, or uh, disability approximately 30%. And here is a, a meta-analysis of this showing a reduction in um, adverse outcome of around 25%. So then we come to the question uh, about uh, hypothermia and uh, the oxygen concentration. So in 2012, Sabir and coworkers from uh, Mariana Tourism's uh, group, uh, they looked at blood gas values, PO2 and PSO2 in 
babies who had been cooled. And they also looked at the, the Bailey scale um, after 18 months or so. And they found an association between increased inspired oxen um, and adverse outcome. So they concluded, and this is eight years ago now, that an increased FIV2 within the first six hours of life was significantly associated with adverse outcome in newborns treated with therapeutic hypothermia. Now, for many years, I've been asking the same question. Um, how does um, the FiO2 or hyperoxia influence the, the result of cooling? And it was very difficult to get a, an answer to this question because all the big studies were carried out with babies who had been resuscitated with 100% oxygen. So together with Mariana Tourism, we, we carried out um, a study in, in newborn rats. Um, so they were made hypoxic and then reoxygenated for 30 minutes. And, um, and they were randomized to be reoxygenated with air or 100% oxygen. And, and these groups again were randomized to normal thermia or hypothermia. So we ended up with four groups. And yeah, so here we can see how the, it was very efficient cooling. Uh, so the rectal temperature uh, dropped during cooling. So this was an efficient uh, model. So this is what we found and the pathology score, this is from hippocampus. Um, so here we have the, the normal temperature, normal thermia here, air versus hundreds of oxygen is not significantly different. However, when you look here at uh, uh, the rats, um, uh, given uh, cooled rats, given uh, air or oxen, you see that there is a big difference in the score, much more injury, significantly more injury if you have had resuscitated the animals with 100% oxen. In fact, all the hypothermia effect disappeared uh, when, uh, when animals have been resuscitated with 100% um, oxen compared with air. So this was quite dramatic findings. We also did a follow-up of these uh, rats and tested postural uh, reflex performance, um, and we found the same pattern. So um, it is, um, uh, based on these data, I am quite uh, convinced that the effect of hypothermia is even, is even higher than what has been reported in, in the meta-analysis and the uh, systematic reviews in this field, because these babies have predominantly been resuscitated with 100% oxygen. So to end up and uh, summarize uh, this uh, lecture about the oxygen therapy and the effect of hypothermia, in the delivery room, uh, babies about 31 weeks, um, I think it is now is agreed that we should start with air. Babies between 28 and 31 weeks start with air or 30% oxygen. Babies less than 28 weeks start with 30% oxygen. I would like to underline that we are not sure what is the optimal here. Maybe it's 40% or, or maybe it's higher. And this is something Julie wants to um, investigate in the Torpedo 2 trial or to, Torpedo 3060 trial which um, you know, hopefully is launched very soon. For all gestational ages, adjust according to the saturation if you have a pulse oximeter available. We, we recommend to start low and tighten it up. Um, some people will disagree with us in that. And I think this is one of the really the, the, the burning uh, questions in, in, um, uh, in neonatology today. Should we start low or should we start high? And in the future, we should uh, adjust the saturation according to sex, CPAP, and, and cord clamping, delayed or early. We need randomized studies uh, to test the significance of uh, saturation of 80% or more at five minutes of age. And we don't know how to adjust the uh, FR2 in the delivery room. Regarding hypothermia, it seems that hypothermia is more efficient when recitation was carried out with 21% instead of 100% oxygen, but we mainly have animal studies. 
we need more clinical data. It's very difficult to get these data today. So <clears throat> as I said, hypothermia therapy probably is even more efficient than described by the clinical randomized studies. So with this, I would like to thank my close collaborators, Siddharth Ramji in Delhi, Max Vento in Valencia, Satyan Lakshmin Rushima in California, Julie Ovi in, in Sydney, our chairperson today, and Vishal Kapade in Texas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ola. Um, I don't look so glamorous. <laughs> it's locked down here. Um, well, yeah. we made it through despite some technical issues. Um, just wondering if anyone had any questions on the chat pane. Um, we've got lots of uh, chat saying that the, <laughs> the presentation broke down. <laughs> yeah. So if, um, if I could ask you, if we were to design a study um, incorporating hypothermia and air resuscitation, how would we do it? I mean, it could be a long time before we get anything like that off ground, but I think it's really necessary. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's possible to do such a study today because uh, <clears throat> we cannot repeat. So I, I've asked people in, in the Vermont Oxford uh, registry and other registries if, if, if it's possible to, to, to get some data where we look at uh, uh, FIO2s, uh, for those babies have been cooled. And uh, so far I have not been able to, to get these data, but I think that that, that is the approach I would uh, try first. And I don't know if anyone um, disagrees with me, but I, I think it's very, I, I don't think anyone would like to do a, a randomized study in this now, uh, because uh, cooling is established. And also I think we, we know that we will not, uh, give term or near term babies uh, um, high FO2s anymore initially. Um, uh, we've got our data custodian, Barbara Bejok, online. Um, Barbara, can you unmute yourself? Um, Barbara is the, um, she's the key holder to our NICUS database in New South Wales, Ola. And she has a very extensive and intricate database. Is that possible, um, um, Barbara, from our NICUS data? Um, sorry, what was the question? Ola wants to look at FiO2 at delivery and um, uh, hypothermia. No, we, we don't. We only collect whether the baby had oxygen or not, not the FiO2. So, okay. no. But it could be a, a field that could be incorporated inside. Um, if it's recorded in the chart, yes, yeah, it can be. Okay, so that might be something we could talk about at the population level. Mm. Um, you've, thank yeah. you, Barbara. Um, okay. So you've got two questions here, one from Rajesh Maheshwari in Sydney. Uh, if oxygen is needed for glottic opening in preterms, why not start high and then titrate? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Well, I tried to answer that, um, and I don't, I don't say I have the, the final answer. Um, we are, um, we are worried about even a brief exposure to hyperoxia in these babies. Uh, and we think that even a few minutes of hyperoxia may trigger long-term effects. Um, so before, um, at least, uh, at the, and when I say we, it's uh, Max Wendt and myself and Satyan who wrote this um, article uh, about this. Uh, uh, we need uh, bigger studies uh, than uh, the one carried out by Decker and co-workers and we'd need long-term follow-up before we should change because, I mean, the whole uh, neonatal community did a, a major mistake for, for, for um, decades uh, or, or two centuries by giving too much oxygen to term babies. And we don't want to repeat that mistake. Uh, but I understand it might be different views on this, but that's my, my opinion so far at this stage. Hopefully we can um, answer that with um, our torpedo study starting high, high-ish yeah. at 60% mm -hmm. and low-ish at 30%. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think we should wait for the results of the Torpedo 2 trial, um, this Torpedo 3060 trial, before we, we really 
is change our practice. So if anyone wants to join, give me a yell. Um, you've got another uh, question from Dr. Yi. Uh, NRP recommendation is to increase FiO2 to 100% when chest compressions is started. Um, is there a need to alter this? Any data on this? Yeah, <clears throat> well, yeah, a very important question. And um, there's no clinical data as far as I know, um, but we have uh, animal uh, experiments, uh, animal data, and we actually we even published a meta-analysis of these animal studies together with George uh, uh, Smolcher in, in Canada. And um, it seems that uh, if you do chest compressions in, in newborn piglets with uh, cardiac arrest after asphyxia, you do as well with air as with 100% oxygen. So, but we don't have clinical data. So if you look at the, the very new ILCOR recommendations that were published just a couple of weeks ago, or three weeks ago, um, they still uh, recommend to start with 100% oxen. However, if you look at uh, the guidelines on pediatric life support, which came out at the same time, they say we don't know. And the reason for, uh, for the difference between the pediatric guidelines, which starts to be around at the age of like four weeks or something like that. Uh, I think the, the main difference was that I was on the panel of you know, the pediatric guidelines. So I, I said that we don't know. And so, um, uh, but we need, a, we need a randomized study. And it is not easy because we don't have many chest compressions. Uh, but we, we need that, it would be very valuable if some of you would like to, to, to carry out such a study. Yep, uh, that would be a very tough study. I think George Schmolzer was trying to do something like that with his SURVIVE trial, um, but uh, that was focusing on the number of chest compressions rather than oxygen. Um, yeah. yeah, so any young keen fellows out there, that would be a great study to take on. Yeah, that would yeah. Make, your, make, your, make your career. <laughs> Yeah, and it will be yeah. very welcomed, very important, yeah. Yes, yes. Um, so the, uh, I guess the take home message, Ola, is that now, uh, depending um, on what evidence you have, if you have an asphyxiated baby, start with air plus cooling equals better than any amount of oxygen. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, the, the data we have, it's, it's, um, it's quite clear, I think, um, especially the animal data. Mm -hmm. And um, what about, uh, because your, your cooling studies are focused on severe HIE, what about the moderate um, HIE, the mild and moderate, which is uh, taking up a lot of our uh, energy yeah. at the moment? Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not aware of any of the data. I might have missed something, but uh, uh, the data I showed you from uh, Vissel Kapadia's um, study, which is uh, now seven years old, um, uh, but it, it is clear that I think that uh, for, first of all, you could prevent the need of uh, hypothermia treatment if you keep the oxen uh, at the physiological level. Uh, I think that is also an important message. Yeah. Uh, and then we have this, uh, the data from, uh, the clinical data from uh, Sabir and coworkers, also published in 2012, eight years ago. Um, indicating the, the same. I think what we need now is to look at what the SPO2s of the term asphyxiated babies are like when you start resuscitating with air. We haven't got that data. Yeah. yeah. Do you yeah. agree? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you are a driving force, uh, <clears throat> Julie, to, oh. to fill the gaps here. I need some people to join my party. <laughs> So but there's several gaps uh, still, yes. Yes. So if anyone's interested in this question, please um, you know, contact Ola and me, um, and uh, we'll be happy to um, you know, welcome you to our party, our oxygen party. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So we are out of time, Ola. You have to run off to Rome, I see. Yeah, I have to go to Rome in the next uh, <laughs> hour. So, and when we I, meet up. I'm extremely sorry that my, you know, I. Actually, what I had, I'd forgotten to plug in my computer. Oh, no. Uh, in both ends. I plugged it just in the socket, not in my computer. 
and uh, and and it won and i thought it was plugged in so it's very embarrassing i'm sorry <laughs> that's all right we were cool we got there yeah, yeah. so uh, i'll send you the link to the uh, zoom recording uh if you're agreeable we'll load it up onto our school website okay so okay thank you again ola and uh, have fun in rome yeah, all right thanks. okay stay safe bye everyone Excellent. bye, bye, -bye. Thank you.